<laughs> I'll try to keep you keep you focused. Today is Tuesday, July 15th. I am H.F. Williamson. I am interviewing William C. Trather for the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress American Folklife Center at his office in Toledo, Illinois. Henry Radcliffe is the Director of Lighting, Sound, and Camera. I'd like you to think back to your time on the campus at the University of Illinois, perhaps just before World War II started, and tell us what it was like to be a student there and the reactions when the war began. Well, it was a wonderful time to exist. There, uh, war wasn't even on the horizon, and uh, student activities were vast. I was very active in student activities and got ahead in student government. In those days, an antiquated system, the men were segregated from the women. So we had uh, women's league and men's league. Now I believe it's all called student government. Right. So I got ahead and ended up as president of the men's part. And uh, that was a big deal. I can imagine. <laughs> so um, then the war came along. So you were president what year? Your junior year? Uh, uh, I was president my senior year, 1942, class of 42. So 41, 42. Uh-huh. And then uh, when did So you were president in December 1941? Yeah, uh-huh. Okay. So so uh, the, the next year, which was my first year of law school. May I, may I oh, ask sure. you to go back and tell us what happened when Pearl Harbor, where you were and when you heard about Pearl Harbor? and Sure. That act I was in my uh, fraternity house playing bridge, you know, which is the world's best game. Uh, I think they call it neurobics nowadays <laughs> to uh, keep your mind alert. I see. So we were playing bridge, and the, somebody came in and said, the Japanese have just attacked Pearl Harbor. Nobody in the house knew where Pearl Harbor was, but we shortly found out. I was... Uh, well, as the campus, as the president of the men's group, were you called upon to be involved in any of the campus activities that took place right after that? Uh, Oh, yeah. What all did you do? Well, not, nothing concerned with the war, really. I mean, did they have assemblies? and Men, Men's League had two junior groups, which uh, one was called Blue Friars and the other was Green Friars. Actually, it was my idea to have those. And um, they, they fanned out, and we had a big time. But then the war came along, and as I told you earlier, I think I was dating Admiral Kimmel's daughter. And um, this was after the Pearl Harbor. Yeah, just after Pearl Harbor. How had that affected her? Well, she uh, remained very silent about it. I can imagine. So that went on for the my first year of law school. But if. During the spring of 42, your senior spring, what was happening on campus? How was the campus affected by the fact? We well, were not much because uh, the, the draft hadn't gone into effect yet, and there, there, there were no uh, military guys on campus until uh, the next year, which was my second First year, in law year of law school. Oh, okay. So then I, along with a bunch of other people, were drafted and went into what we called Army Specialized Training Corps, which uh, they taught us to a language and all how to get uh, a defeated country back in order. So our job was to uh, move into the town and 
got the lights okay. uh, working and the water working and take care of the criminal element. And in other words, we were military government. Right. But in France, we were called civil affairs and became military government once we got into Germany. Uh -huh. so for, you, did the French, you didn't want the French to think you were trying to take over their government. Exactly. Okay. And they, about, they, were, they were generally very, very friendly. Okay. I hate to keep returning this, but I'm, I am curious about what happened on campus during your, that year and a half that you, before you were drafted. In other words, was there rationing? Uh, what happened when the, the V-12 people came to campus? Did this have an no, impact? No, the, the only thing I can remember was, and actually this was at home more than the campus, was the uh, all households were asked to uh, donate aluminum pans right. for some reason connected with manufacturing arms. So at the end of my second year in law school, I was drafted right. in this little town where we are and went in and got into ASTP. So where was the training? Where did that training take place? In Worcester, Massachusetts. Was it on a college? Clark, Clark University. And uh, I met similar guys with interest of mine and we wrote another musical comedy in the army, if you will, and uh, it played. You say another, had you written one? Well, as a student? back at the University of Illinois, yeah. Which year was that? That was my senior year, 1942. Now, how did the how did writing the how was the writing of the musical affected by the fact we were at war? Did you have to take that into account? Oh no, this was before the war. Well, 42. Yeah. Okay. Pearl Harbor was what, 43, wasn't it? No, 41. Oh, was it? Well, I'm confused on my dates. But That's understandable. Anyway, it, it didn't uh, affect the campus very much one way or the okay. other. And this was a general gridiron show like they have at Princeton. Right. Hasty pudding. No, that's Harvard, isn't it? Right. So ours was called Let's Get Away and had nothing to do with the war. But during the war, as I told you, when we were in ASTP, uh, a fellow soldier named Ed Hirschberg, and I wrote another one for the Army situation. And this played in Boston. Oh, my gosh. And it was called Warren Brown this year. <laughs> <laughs> more, more than just one year. Yeah. In years, yes. <laughs> so but then... How long, how long did the training take place at Worcester before you were It was there a year. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And then you were Then shipped. we were sent over to England to be deployed, and we were in Manchester. Was that further training at that time? No, that was waiting okay. to move into France. We were trained by that time. And we got our jeeps and everything in order. This was before D-Day? Yeah. Okay. But I tell you, Eisenhower did some awfully good planning. He was planning, you know, on how to govern these countries once we took over. That's something that present-day generals aren't doing, I don't believe. Anyway, we were there. Um, I, I remember I had a jeep called the misogynist <laughs> and uh, we had to fill up the tailpipes with gunk and all that sort of thing to get it ready to go into France so you uh, I'll never forget when the final day came and all these balloons were we uh, went off Dartmouth all these balloons, it, it looked like another world. I bet. Every balloon with a steel cable down so, you know, no airplane could come in and bomb us. So here we were. There must have been a hundred jeeps. 
and the same thing. Uh, and we were loaded. And by guys went on to the LST boat. And perfect order. It was very well organized. And we got to France. This was D plus three. Okay. And uh, the uh, gates went down. We were supposed to drive onto the shores of France, which we all wanted to do. Well, they, they had said, you know, if you're underwater, under no circumstance do you, uh, what do you call it, goose a car. Right. I can't remember what it was. That makes sense, yeah. And anyway, we uh, got halfway into shore. This Jeep, myself, I was the driver, three other guys standing up in the Jeep. We were all underwater, driving like this. Halfway into shore, the jeep coughed. Uh oh! I tell you, that was a bad moment. <laughs> anyway, the decision was to goose it or not goose it, so I did. <coughs> and that old jeep, the misogynist, just picked right up and drove right onto the shores of France. A couple of us got out of the jeep and kissed the <laughs> kissed France. <laughs> So, so how long before you were able to start doing your military government affairs? Well, we landed at uh, Utah Beach, and uh, within two days we were able to m move up to the top of the Cotentin Peninsula, a little, little town called Beaumont de la Hague. And that's where we set up uh, my, just my Jeep. Four of us set up military or civil affairs in Beaumont, and there wasn't too much to do there. We had a problem with the lights, getting the lights back on, but we did. Now, this, you, what, you were you an enlisted man or an officer at this time? I was a technical sergeant okay. at that point. And the others on your jeep were any of them the officers then leading your? We group? had one, uh, one second lieutenant. But these guys were pretty important in those days. Okay, that's an important so, four-man team. The, yeah. You were the city government at the time, I presume. Yeah. And so then how long did you stay there before? Did you move on? And well, we, we were there until, we, um, until the other guys liberated Paris. So we had done our job in the um, little town out there and drove into Paris and set up shop there in one of the around, uh, arrondissements, they call them. And we interviewed people and did, did the usual, but not too much, you know, getting the lights on. They were on. So then uh, we were sent out to Thionville, T-H-I-O-N-ville. And that's where we sort of relaxed for a while. We were getting ready for the big move into Germany by that time. And, uh, but the best was yet to come. We were about three or four miles from the Battle of the Bulge. And that's when all the soldiers showed their medal. We had a few who were crying in the night, if you know what I mean. But Patton prevailed, and so we moved into Germany. I was lucky enough to go to a bigger detachment now in uh, Darmstadt. That was across the Rhine, oh, two or three miles, a rather large city, a couple hundred thousand. So we governed that city for the next year, I guess. Got it back in... Uh, was that through the end of the war then, about? Yeah, I okay. stayed there through the end of the war. And all the people turned in their arms. My one war souvenir is that uh, calf's foot right there, which, which was a knife, and they had to turn in every weapon. And that's the only one I kept. So do you, overall, you felt that the unit had been a su pretty successful 
Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, but we, we had, I had to learn German in that one year at uh, Worcester. And I loathed the language. And hmm. So consequently to this day, what about 60 years later, I don't speak a word of German. But I do speak every word of French that I ever knew. Oh, nice. Because I loved that language. Were, 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 was any of your University of Illinois training involved in the fact they chose you to be in this unit? I mean, was it because you'd had law school experience? Well, yeah, yeah, you, the, the law, the one year of law really got me into that unit. Right. Because that's what we were. You know, we were to bring law and order to the okay. towns we took over. If I may, I'd like to go back to that one year law school because here you are, you just graduated from college during a war, yeah. and you're in a limbo, are you not? Because you're in law school, but you're not sure when it's going to call up. What is that? What was that feeling like? That well, uh, you, you, you said it exactly right. There was sort of a feeling of limbo. For one thing, um, I, I took criminal law as a course in law school that year. So when I came back from the war, went back to law school, I took uh, enough to graduate, I thought. But just before graduation, the dean, dean Harno called me in and said, you know, you don't have enough credits to graduate. Well, it seems that I had taken criminal law twice. Oh, no. Once before the war, forgot about it. It wasn't a very important course and took it again after the war, so it didn't add up to enough. Fortunately, though, I'd signed up for an audit course and, believe it or not, income tax. <laughs> so I studied that for the next week or so and took the exam, made an A in the course, and <laughs> graduated. graduated. <laughs> Where were you living during this year? I mean, how was the housing situation? Was it on campus during that um, Well, I was living, well, before the war, I lived in a fraternity house, but after the war, I came I'm back. I'm talking about the, your first year in law school while the war had occurred. Was, there, was housing tight at that point? Yeah. Because some of the, had some of the V-12 students arrived on campus by then? No, I don't think they were there until I was drafted. Okay. But after the war, we, with my best buddy, who was also in law school, Bob Blumquist, we lived, uh, shared an apartment over the barber shop there on Green, on, yeah, Green Street. Because oh. <laughs> housing was particularly tight then, I assume. Yeah. Uh huh. What proportion of your class, that first, that second year, what proportion were returning veterans like yourself? Would you guess? Was it a significant number? I have no idea. Because on campus, among the undergraduates, you had the GI uh -huh. Bill students. Well, I, I do know something about that because I was in the um, Illini Marching Band oh. under um, Harding. And uh, it was reconstituted when I got back. and. Not at full strength, though. So there was some impact on yeah. extracurricular activities. Yeah. Uh -huh. And back in those days, we had Chief Illini Wack, you know. <laughs> I know. He has a long history. Yeah. So um, when you came back, you were coming back with a mass of veterans that came back to the campuses in 1945, 46. And yeah. Yeah, that, made that, very that is tight. correct. Uh -huh. That's why I was concerned about how easy it was to, or how hard it was to find housing. Yeah. So then I graduated in 19, class of 1947. I should have told her, though, I got demobbed in uh, December of 45. Five, and got back to be with my parents for Christmas 
1945, Christmas Eve. How sweet. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> so what did you do that spring while you were waiting to go back to law school? I went back to law school. Oh, you were I able was to able to tack right on. Oh, that's good. Yeah, for the second semester. Was, did the law school um, add weeks of classes the way they did in the undergraduate? I understand the university went into a three semester program. I believe they might have because um, I was home Christmas Eve and I was in law, law classes in two weeks. Okay. So they had an accelerated yeah, schedule. Yeah, that was it. Uh, How long, I wonder, did that last before they went back? I, I don't know. I graduated in 47 and went immediately to Chicago for my first right. job. So things were beginning to get back to normal by then, do you think? Oh, or? yes. Uh, they were almost completely back to normal by the time I graduated. Although there were a lot more students on campus probably oh, with my, the returning yes. veterans. That became, at about that time, a huge university, as opposed to being just big. <laughs> <laughs> How would you come to go to the University of Illinois? How did you choose that? I had nothing to say about it. My parents decided I was going to be a lawyer and where I was going to school. It, so be it. <laughs> now, that your parents were living in... Urbana at that time? Yeah, at so uh, 1117 um, East or West Illinois? West Illinois. West Illinois. Where the Cranert Art Center is now. Oh my gosh. So part of it was that, that you would be in in, the, in your hometown? That was yeah. maybe a part of the reason they selected it? Uh-huh. Did you live at home? Well, that was kind of a bone of contention. I wanted to live in the fraternity house, and they <laughs> wanted me to live at home. So I did a little of both. <laughs> Which fraternity were you a member of? Phi Gamma Delta. Okay. Did the fraternities get affected by the start of the war? Did membership decline? Did they have to change anything? Oh, yes. Um, all fraternities sort of went downhill at that point. And I'm sorry to say that uh, mine was included. It was hard to get pledge classes. But with Dean Turner's help, Fred Turner, yes, uh, it survived. So he tried to maintain as much of the peacetime uh, social existence as possible yeah, to uh -huh. help. All right. Did you keep in contact with your fraternity after you came back? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Now, were there a lot of veterans that joined the fraternity after the war? Yeah, afterward. Uh -huh. Did that have any impact on the, on the fraternity? I mean, if, it would seem to be hard to haze a man who had just been in combat as a, <laughs> as a pledge. Yeah. Well, actually, the fraternity was decommissioned a couple of years afterward, but it's recommissioned recently. I see. But I, I worked for Fred Turner at his uh, desk there. I've forgotten what the building was now. Lincoln Hall? That no. would be... The most logical place, yes. And uh, I'll never forget, he had four telephones on this desk. Now, this was your first year in law school you were talking about? Or? Yeah. Okay. And to have that many telephones. <laughs> and now, how did, what was his view of the, the, this was the first major year of the war. How did he feel the campus should behave uh, from the perspective of the dean of students? Well, surprisingly, the, the war didn't have much impact, at least on me or the dean. It was pretty much business as usual. Except that some of your students are being drafted into yeah. their military. Uh -huh. and Made to be included later. Yes. <laughs> what, what would happen to a student who was drafted in terms of his academic? Would he be allowed to finish the semester, or did he have to go in right away? Well, I'm trying to reconstruct my own, and I believe we had no choice. You were just drafted, and uh, heck with your college. So I career. imagine Dean Turner had a lot of students asking him for help on 
finishing a semester or getting uh -huh. credits they'd earned. But I, I don't think uh, that was built into the military draft. You were just drafted. I see. Whether you were in college or grade school or what. Seems a little ironic because didn't the V-12 program bring people back to campuses to give them an education so they'd be better trained? Yeah. As the missile. The, well, that's how I went back to Clark University, I guess. Right. But as we so, were AS Army Specialized right. Training Corps. Now, what is this other? I'm sorry. Group? The, there were on the University of Illinois campus. I think there were both the V-12 Navy and the ASTP oh, Army program. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. They had the same purpose uh -huh. in general, which is to bring people back for training. Well, I wasn't aware of any of that, really, when I was at the university. I understand. <laughs> but it was an academic setting, I guess, to get that knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. From the people at the faculties. Well, the University of Illinois was my friend from the beginning, and it remained my friend my whole life. I understand. What else, any other memories you'd like to share with us about that period? I, I mean, you are our generation the, that went through the Depression and then World War II and played such a major role in the outcome of that war. Well. I do know this, that the Mothers of America almost did in the ASTP. How so? Well, when uh, the infantry was in Europe, the mothers pointed the finger at we in the ASTP, who were in college, so to speak, oh. learning languages and how to take over and all that sort of thing. And they brought pressure to bear, get those lazy lugs out of college and into the trenches, because our boys are losing their lives. Well, it's exactly what they did. They pulled people out of ASTP that didn't know how to shoot the carbine yet, and a lot of them died. But. Uh, we persisted. Well, I, I had understood that that happened particularly when the Battle of the Bulge began and they needed troops so badly. I hadn't realized it had been a more general concern uh -huh. or complaint. That's interesting. Yeah. So they, they didn't appreciate the, the need for trained, educated soldiers. No. Well. <laughs> well, you wouldn't when you are a mother. You, you're yeah. at uh, for your own child. Yeah. You want as much support as possible. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us before the interview is over? Well, no, not really. While we were thinking about your activities, you were president of the, the men's student body. Mm -hmm. You were <laughs> co-writing the show. You were in the band. What instrument did you play, by the way? Tennis saxophone. Oh, my gosh. Did you in play the marching that? marching band, huh? Okay. Did you ever play it for... For uh, in other groups like uh, swing bands or things like that, as a my buddy Bob Blomquist did. He played a tenor saxophone too. But uh, he played around in various bands. Dick Sisney, have you ever heard of him? I don't think so, but uh, I'm not very well known, very well versed. I, I wasn't that kind of a sax player. I I was a marching band guy. Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. Henry reminded me, um, which am I asking you? Okay. I'd like to go back. You were telling me you co-authored that musical for the, the show. Yeah. And it was 1942. Uh-huh. So, I mean, again, was, were some of the skits related to the fact that the war was going on and that you were vulnerable to the draft? Or how did that work? Yes, there, there were a couple of scripts uh, along that line. But to be honest, I, I've forgotten their exact nature. But you were taking that into account. Oh, right? yes. Uh -huh. Because. Oh. No, I take that back. 
I did work a thing in there, and it was called Warren Brown this year. Right. In our original college musical. Ah. Went on, you know, in the, in the Army to uh, give that name to the actual right. Army said, show. That's right. But it had its uh, origin in the college show, Warren Brown this year. Which was a reminder, maybe not needed, that many of your audience were going yeah, to be doing that. Within, exactly. Uh -huh. right. So it was not something anyone was unaware of. People were well aware of that. And, oh, there was another skit in there, too. I'd forgotten this. You're bringing back. Uh, there was a song. Goodbye, Green Street. Hello, Hong Kong. We're <laughs> really going to win this war. <laughs> You do that well, <laughs> both in terms of your memory and in terms of your performance, yeah. yes. Well, it was my song. Well, <laughs> I hope you got all the royalties then. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of a royalty at that point. Were these shows a uh, annual occurrence? Yes, uh-huh. Okay. Well, it's, it's like they have, uh, you've probably heard of the Harvard Hasty Pudding oh, yes, Club, right. and what's the one they have at Princeton? Uh, I've forgotten. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so, I mean, will you select? Did you select yourself to do this, or were you? Was there a competition to see who was the best writer? Or well, I sort of hate to see this, say this, but um, I was president of this right. government bit, and uh, that president selected scripts. Aha. Uh -huh. So I selected mine. My, uh, with another fellow, our fraternity brother, Bob Fuller, right. was the co-author of it. Were there any other uh, hopeful authors? or? Oh, sure. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so you were judge and jury and uh, plaintiff. And On that one. particular <laughs> thing, yes. Well, it sounds like you did a good job. So that's Well, I, it was appreciated. It was a good show. Where did they hold the shows? Um, was it in Lincoln Hall Theater or? Lincoln Hall Theater, that's okay. where it was. Uh, How many performances were there? Um, there was only one. Okay. How did you choose the cast and who directed it? Well, me and my buddy uh, did that. Oh, you were author and director? Yeah. And casting and all that? Uh -huh. Oh, my gosh. Was it a co-ed show? Yes, yes, it was okay. a co-ed show. All right. Oh, Betty Stiglitz. She was the president of the Women's League, mm -hmm. and we worked together with her on this show, too. Right. So she must have uh, picked a lot of the cast. Was the competition to be in the show quite keen, or...? It sort of faded. I was pretty busy in those days. And I bet. Yeah, yeah, I was keen. Uh, yeah. But it was a huge success. And were, you char were you charging admission? Did this generate income for something? Yes, because I remember uh, giving some tickets to some of my relatives that came up for the show. <laughs> That's fair. Which reminds me, it was... Was there much activity on campus to raise money for the government, like savings bonds or things like that, bond drives and uh, war-related activities? Well, this was in '42. Right, but the war had started, so. But I don't know if the bond drives had. No, I, I don't. Th there wasn't much sign of it. Okay. About the only sign I can think of was a song in our show. Right. Of course, sure. And of course, the threat of draft was over everybody. Right. All the men. Yeah. And then that spring rationing started, at least with respect to some things. Yeah, that's right. Again, is there something, anything else about your campus wartime experiences you'd like to uh, tell us? Well, an awful lot was happening awfully quick. But no, I, I believe that's about it. <laughs> okay. Anything else you'd like me to think about? Well, we thank you very much for having us to your office and 
for giving us this interview and for all you did during the war for your country. We appreciate that. We're glad Thank we had you. a chance to talk about it. Okay. I've enjoyed it.